So I'm doing a program on baseball, you know, the national pastime. Baseball, hot dogs, Chevrolet, that sort of thing. She'll have her hot dog cart on 16th Street. Um, very good. We'll also have uh, no Chevrolets, though. Be um, doing a tribute for the 100th anniversary of the Benwood Mine Disaster, which is still the third largest mining disaster in the history of this state. And it will have been 100 years as of April 28th this year. Uh, on the 30th, Faustoria Glass. That should be a popular program. Gary Ryder again. And then on May 7th, again, Barnstorming Baseball here in Wheeling. Don't miss it. Lots of cool stuff happening. Today we're going to talk about Appalachian fish. And Stuart Welsh is a fisheries research scientist with the U.S. Geological Surveys Cooperative Research Unit Program and a professor at of ichthyology, ichthyology at West Virginia University where he focuses on graduate education and research. He's published over eight peer-reviewed papers and scientific publications. Some of his favorite pastimes are spending time with family, fishing, playing guitar. You should have brought your guitar. Writing songs and he rides some kind of cyclocross bike and uh, he also loves baseball here and hot dogs. Here is Stuart Welsh. Thanks, John. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm truly excited to be here with you today um, to talk about a book that I uh, recently published with Ohio University Press. And the book is titled Horny Heads, Mad Toms, and Darters, Narratives on Central Appalachian Fishes. And um, what I'd like to do is to begin with a bit of background on why I wrote this book. And uh, for about 23 years now, I've been at my current position at West Virginia University, and my focus is on research, and I do a lot of work with graduate students. And uh, we uh, typically, uh, one of our end products is to publish our research in uh, a peer-reviewed journal. And, um, and But uh, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, and they're about different ways to get the message out. Um, because certainly a, a lot of people do not read scientific journals. And so I started thinking about this idea of nature writing. And to me, that means pre presenting the science in more of a uh, user-friendly term, um, and which I think will reach a wider audience in a book format. And I, I'm targeting people that I consider to be naturalists. And these are people that have an interest in nature. They're very inquisitive, and they like the outdoors. And I think there's a lot of people out there with those types of interests. And so I want to reach these people with a book about Central Appalachian fishes. And so I summarize my, uh, my book as, as a collection of stories on nature, naturalists, and the natural history of fishes. And it's focused on the Central Appalachians. And this is a fairly large uh, geographic area. It, it includes all of West Virginia, um, part of uh, Eastern Ohio, part of Eastern Kentucky, uh, Western uh, Virginia, a um, small section of Maryland, a large portion of Pennsylvania, and a small portion of New York. And there's a lot of interesting fishes that occur in this region. And so for the book format, um, I have 23 chapters in my book, and um, I start each chapter with an illustration to set the stage for the reader, and I ask why questions in the text. And these are questions like, why does a fish have a particular kind of behavior? Why does a fish spawn in a certain way? Um, it's typically about a, a single species of fish each chapter, but sometimes it's about a group of fishes. Um, but within the text, I answer these why questions with uh, ecological explanations. And I try to link in what I call old school naturalists. And these are people that worked uh, uh, in past centuries 
um, that did research on, on fishes, and they're very, very interesting people, and a lot of their work is somewhat forgotten because it's just in, you know, in books, and, but, you know, it's, it's, they really set the stage for the current research, and so I think it's important to, to remember these people, and so I brought them back out in my chapters, and I also include uh, photographs in each chapter to uh, engage the reader, and so for this talk, what I'm going to do is highlight nine areas of emphasis that I tried to get across within my book chapters. The first area of emphasis was on charismatic species. And there's one fish in, um, in West Virginia that truly fits this category, and that is the candy darter. And this chapter was titled Charismatic Candy. And this is one instance where the black and white introductory uh, illustration uh, was not the best option because this fish is truly beautiful. And here's a picture of the male candy darter. And so I spent a lot of time in this chapter just focusing on the beauty of this fish. And, and I went uh, fin by fin talking about the pigmentation patterns and just how attractive this fish is to look at. And I also uh, emphasized non-native species um, in, my, uh, in my book, and I, um, and I continue with the topic of the candy darter because the candy darter is currently impacted by a non-native fish, um, and that fish is called the variegate darter, which is on the lower right. Um, the variegate darter was introduced into the drainage where the candy darter lives, and these two are closely related species, and often in fishes, when you have two closely related uh, species, there's a possibility of hybridization. And that's what is happening here with the variegate darter and the candy darter. They are hybridizing, and the center photograph there represents a first generation hybrid. Now, in some animals, uh, hybrids are sterile, but in this case, the hybrids are not sterile, and so they can also uh, spawn with, with either a candy darter or a variegate darter. And you have something called back crossing, where the genes get mixed up between the two species and you you end up with a what's called a hybrid swarm which is just a, a bunch of hybrids you end up with not having either candy darters or variegate darters over time and this is a problem for the candy darter because it's swamping out um, the candy darter population in certain parts of its range and so that's one example of how a non-native species can be very negative um, to aquatic ecosystems uh, another non-native that i talk about is a chapter on the common carp. And I title this carp fin, which is the German name for the fish. And the common carp is interesting because it was introduced to the Eastern United States and, it, and, and it's uh, very common now in many places, pretty much any water that you go to, you can find common carp. And I got to get into the life and times of a man named Spencer Baird. And Baird was perhaps the greatest American naturalist. He uh, started the uh, National Museum, the Smithsonian, in 1850. He was uh, later appointed as the commissioner of the U.S. Fish Commission by President Grant in 1871. This man did a lot of great uh, things in his life for conservation, but he has one blemish, and that was the introduction of the common carp. He was solely responsible for, for that. And so I spent a lot of time in this story just kind of going back in time and explaining what Baird was thinking at the time and why he uh, decided to push the introduction of common carp into the eastern U.S. because currently most people uh, do not have a positive view of the common carp because it does cause a lot of issues in some of our aquatic ecosystems. I also emphasize new discoveries. And for this, I wrote a chapter titled Discovering Diamonds. And this is about a fish called the diamond darter. And the diamond darter is a a species of fish that I described as new to science in 2008. And I called it the diamond darter because it, it's out at nighttime, it's nocturnal. And, and, and so for us to uh, research and, and find out new information about this fish, we have to be out in the river at night with a flashlight or a spotlight. And when you shine a light on this fish at night, the area just underneath the eye, which is called the cheek or the opercle, it's uh, very reflective, and so the light kind of reflects, and it sparkles like a diamond, and that's the reason I called this fish the diamond darter. But we've learned a lot of information about this uh, through the years. Uh, one thing we know is that it loves sand, and it buries its body in the sand. 
And this is one of perhaps one of my favorite science terms, uh, Samophilus, which means sand loving. And um, here you have a photograph of a diamond darter that's buried in the sand, but its head is slightly sticking out. But often these fish, when they bury in the sand, their entire body is embedded in the sand and they stay down in the sand, typically during the daytime, then they come out at night. And so next I have a video just to show you this interesting behavior of how the fish buries into the sand. And so it's a really interesting behavior. And, and so as you would imagine, sand is very important to its environment, to its habitat. And the diamond darter is a rare fish. It has a very limited distribution. The only place where it occurs in the world is in the lower section of the Elk River in West Virginia. This is a distribution map. The black dots represent places where it has been found. And it's just in the lower Elk River system, just upstream from Charleston. It also has a very interesting habitat type. Most people are familiar with, riff, with rivers, and, and um, in, the, in the left of this photograph, you can see the riffle, which is the whitewater area. Um, upstream, much farther, you see that deep green or blue um, shape, uh, blue area there, and that's the deeper water, and which is called a pool habitat, but there's this area in between, just up above where the riffle head starts. You can kind of see the brown, stream bottom there, and that's an area that has very good sand deposition. And this is the type of place where we find the diamond darters, just upstream of the riffle head. And so to do research on this fish, we go out at nighttime with lights, and they're actually not too difficult to find. Um, here's a photograph of one that we have in a spotlight, and you can see it has uh, some pigment patterns on its back. Um, they're, they're called saddles. They cross over the back like a saddle and stands out, makes the fish stand out quite nicely when you shine a light on it. But, um, you know, typically that fish would use that pattern for camouflage, um, um, but it's, you know, not used to having someone shine a flashlight on it. And so that, that doesn't work very well for camouflage in that case. And it helps us find the fish very easily. I also emphasized um, unusual fishes. And one chapter was on was a titled anomalous anatomy and this was about a very common species that we have in central Appalachia called the uh, stone roller minnow and the stone roller minnow has some interesting characters um, unusual characters one is that it has these bumps on its head the males do and they're called breeding tubercles and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later under a chapter called horny head um, but another uh, interesting aspect of the uh, of the stone roller is that it has this horseshoe shaped mouth. And so the upper left photograph is, a, is an illustration of the mouth shape. It's kind of a horseshoe shape, but the lower lip is hard. It's cartilaginous. And it, so it has this hard lower ridge on its, on its lip. And then it also has a really long intestine, which is shown by the cutout on the lower image. And so these are kind of unusual characters. And in this chapter, I got to talk about a lot of interesting science terms like herbivory and autotrophs and paraphyton and trophic cascades. And I'm not going to go into these terms now because I'm hoping that you'll buy the book and, and have an interest in reading about these. Um, but, but the uh, explanation is that this hard ridge, that these fish are, are herbivores, and so they actually eat algae that grows on the rocks. And that hard ridge on the lower lip is used to scrape the algae off of the rocks. And so it can then eat the algae. Fish that eat plant matter often have a very long intestine, whereas fishes that eat other fish um, typically have much shorter intestines. And so the reason for the long intestine is because it eats pl plant matter. And so it's kind of interesting to think about a, a fish that you know, has a diet of just focusing mostly on algae. Another unusual uh, behavior that I documented and I, I wrote about in a chapter called Smokescreen Foraging was on the northern pike. And the northern pike is a really fascinating fish. It's a huge fish. They get, uh, um, it's not unusual to find one 50 inches long. And so they get fairly large. And they have a bunch of interesting colloquial names. And my favorite is Sharp Tooth McGraw. 
um, but they're they're really beautiful fish, and they have some pretty interesting behaviors. And this story allowed me to get into the life of a man named Nico Tenbergen, who he's a well-known animal behaviorist. And in his writing, he was always talking about watching and wondering. And one of the things he watched and wondered about was the northern pike and how it forages. And he came up with this idea called S-start foraging, which is shown here in the illustration. And this is where the pike, before it attacks its prey, it gets its body into this S shape. And then it uses the muscles on both sides of its body to contract in a way that allows it to dart forward really fast at its prey. And typically it darts from a motionless or near motionless position right at its prey very fast. It's called a fast strike. And so this is the way that northern pike typically feed. And so it, in this story, I talk about an interesting observation that I made with my son. And we were ice fishing for yellow perch and we were fishing with underwater cameras. And so we had a camera down where we could see our fishing lure. And it's a fun way to fish because you can watch the fish approach the lure and you can learn a lot about the fish's behavior. And so, but what we saw that in, on that day was a, a northern pike approach the lure. And when I play the video here in a, in a minute, you'll see the pike approach from the right side of the screen. And, and what it does is it takes its left and right pectoral fins in a rowing motion, kind of rows the bottom of the lake. And it causes the sediment on the bottom to come up in a cloud or a plume. And then the pike kind of embeds its body in this plume of silt, gets underneath the jig, and then, and then comes up and takes the bait. And so it's a really interesting and unusual behavior, but it reminded me kind of of a military maneuver uh, known as a smoke screen. And so I'm going to play the video, and I'll let you see this for yourself. So it was an interesting behavior, and uh, I have to tell you, though, my son did catch the fish. It was a 27-inch northern pike, and, and he was a young lad at the time and very excited, and I was really excited for him, but it left me kind of scratching my head as to why a northern pike would, would forage or feed in this unusual way. Now, I will say that as a scientist, you know, this represents a sample size of one. Um, so it doesn't necessarily lend to strong inference, but as a naturalist, it's a very fascinating observation, and it's certainly something worth writing about. Another unusual fish that I talk about is the American eel. And one of the reasons uh, this fish is unusual is because it's different than any other fish that we have in central Appalachia. And I can show this difference by talking about its life history. Uh, it has many uh, stages of its life, but it this fish spawns in the Sargasso Sea, which is an area of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the eggs hatch and develop into a larval form called a leptocephalus, which looks a lot like a willow leaf. This larva then floats with the ocean currents into um, the, the uh, shelf, the continental shelf toward the shoreline, and um, it changes, the larva changes into a form that looks more like an eel. It's called a glass eel, but there's no pigment on it. You can actually see through the fish, and then it starts to develop pigment, it's called an elver, and as it grows a little larger, it's referred to as a yellow eel, and these yellow eels actually swim up rivers, and they go a long way up rivers, up into the headwaters often, and um, the females are the ones that typically go the farthest upstream, and, and they spend many years up there, sometimes depending on latitude, up to 20 years um, growing and maturing, and then when they become an adult, when they're ready to spawn, they go through another change where they become very silvery. They're called a silver eel at that time. And those silver eels then migrate back down the rivers and go all the way back down to the Sargasso Sea to spawn and start the process. So it's a really fascinating, interesting fish that we have here uh, in Appalachia as part of its uh, life cycle. But the story really is focused a lot on my research that I've done over 20 years on on dam passage and how these eels get up uh, around dams in the rivers that they're traveling. And there are some fish ways that we 
designed specifically for eels that we call eel ladders that help them get up and down. But they also find other ways to get around these dams. But it's just interesting to think about how they can navigate these rivers with the dams and how they can get upstream and downstream. And so I spent a lot of time in my story talking about that journey, that long journey that they take up and down the river. I also wrote a story, a uh, chapter titled Horny Head. And the Horny Head is an interesting name. It's fun to say. And as a kid, they were always fun to catch. I spent a lot of time fishing in small creeks, uh, fishing for horny heads. And a lot of people that I talked to uh, asked me, you know, what is a horny head? I, I, I heard about it and I've even caught a few, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. And so uh, it's actually a name of a group of minnows. And all of these minnows get these breeding tubercles on their head. And these tubercles are, um, are a character of the males. And the males in the population, uh, uh, when they spawn, they have these tubercles and they use them to spar and to defend their territories with and so forth. But there's a lot of different species that get this. And, and they're all referred to as horny heads, even though the photograph of the fish that I have on the screen now is officially named a horny head chub. There's other chubs within this same group that are also called horny heads uh, as a colloquial name. And here's an example of the blue head chub, as you can see the, the horns on its head. Um, and and it's, in some ways, it's kind of like a white-tailed deer. Most people are familiar with that, that the deer uh, grow antlers and, and they have them during their breeding season, but then afterwards the antlers are lost and then they regrow them the following year. And, the, and these horny head chubs do the same thing. They have these bumps or horns on their head during the breeding season. They're lost uh, later and then they regrow them back for the next spawning season. I also emphasize predator-prey relationships. And I did this in a story called Like a Rolling Stone. And this story was focused on a fish called a log perch. It's a beautiful little fish. Um, they get about um, you know, four or five inches long. It's a fairly small fish. But they have this interesting zebra-striped pigmentation pattern on their side. And um, this, this story allowed me to talk about a man named Abbott Henderson Thayer, who was uh, perhaps one of America's greatest painters. And he was known as the painter of angels, but he was also known as the father of camouflage. And many of his concepts uh, on camouflage are still in use today. And that includes background matching, counter shading and disruptive coloration. And I'm not again, I don't want to go into uh, too much detail on these terms now because I want you to to buy the book and, and read more on this. But um, but I can tell you that all of these concepts apply well to the log perch and also, in addition to these, there's another little predator avoidance mechanism that the log perch has, and that is a, a distinct spot right at the base of its tail fin. You can see a nice dark spot right there, and that is often referred to as an eye mimic. A, a lot of fishes have this eye mimic spot, and the idea here, the hypothesis anyway, is that predators will often attack a small fish. They'll attack its head um, by focusing in on its eyes. And so a predator approaching this fish may be confused and see that spot, that dark spot on the base of the tail and think it's an eye and then attack the prey from the back end, which gives the prey a little more chance of escaping that way. And so it's a helpful uh, pigmentation pattern um, for that. Another predator-prey uh, relationship that I discussed was about uh, a small group of catfishes uh, that are called mad toms. And most people, when they think about catfish, they think about a big fish, like uh, a blue catfish or a flathead catfish that get really large. But these mad tom catfishes, this is a group of catfish that um, typically, or depending on the species, will range from three inches to six inches in length. That's as big as they get. So they're a small type of catfish. There's a, quite a diversity of them in, in central Appalachians. The two I show here are the brindled mad tom and the margin mad tom, but they're really interesting little fish and one of the ways that they can avoid predators is the use of spines that they have these hard spines that they have on their pectoral fins and i show in this image um, the spines of uh, six different species and so the shapes of these spines are a little variable depending on the species but these spines are really hard and sharp and pointy and what they can do is they can erect their spines out like this and it makes their body look bigger and, and it makes them more difficult to swallow for uh, to protect them from predators. 
And so they have these spines and they're able to lock them in place. If you've ever held a catfish in, with, the, with their spines locked in place and tried to depress those spines, it's almost impossible. They just won't go down. And they have, in this illustration, I show the numbers one, two, and three, and that represents how these spines are able to lock into place. There's two, um, there's two friction points and then one interlocking key that locks in when they sp spread their spines out. But also of interest here is that at the base of these spines is a venom gland. And so um, a lot of people don't realize that some fishes are venomous, but these Mad Tom catfishes are very venomous. And so if you were to hold one in your hand and you were to get stuck in the hand by one of those spines, it would feel a lot like a bee sting. Um, it hurts. Um, and I've been stung by many by handling these because they're very tricky to handle. They're kind of small and they're always jumping around, flipping around. Um, but um, these, these venom glands and the production of venom is another predator avoidance strategy that these small catfishes use. I also emphasize public attitudes. Um, one chapter in particular was about the long-nosed gar, and it's a, it's a fairly common fish that we have in the Ohio River. Um, the chapter was titled Ill Regarded. Um, there's a lot of people that have a negative view of the gars, and, and, uh, and so I tried to talk about the importance of predators in our uh, fish uh, communities and, and um, tried to dispel the myths that uh, gars are really bad uh, to be out there in the communities because I think they have, there's, there's a lot of attraction to them, a lot of important points about them that I tried to emphasize. And I got into the, the life of a man named uh, Bashford Dean, who was a Renaissance man. He wore many hats. And one of those was a curator of arms and armor at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But he was interested in gars mainly because gars have these interesting scales that are called ganoid scales. It's almost like a really hard armoring all over their body. And uh, so he studied gars in part because of this, but he did a lot of writing about the gars. And he really emphasized the importance of the gars in our fish communities and that they are not negative and they're not a bad thing like a lot of people would really think have have the idea that they are and so there i tried to emphasize that message that the gars are important to have in our fish communities along a similar line i talked about a group of fishes called suckers in a chapter called sucker savvy and and this is another case where a lot of people have a negative attitude or a negative view about these fish um, they are bottom feeders um, a lot of people don't like that um, they're not so easy often to catch on rod and reel. Sometimes people don't like that. Uh, some people have the idea that they eat the eggs of other fishes in the stream. Um, there's all these uh, reasons why people don't like suckers, but they're actually very important to our aquatic uh, communities. And so I try to emphasize in this story just how important these fishes are to have. And uh, two of my favorites are shown here on the right, the high fin carp sucker and the torrent sucker. I also emphasized reproductive behavior in fishes, and I did this in a chapter titled Satellite Sunfish. And this is about a sunfish called the bluegill. It's a very common fish. A lot of people, when they start fishing when they're young, they catch bluegills on a, on a hook and a bobber and a worm. And they're fun to catch, and, but they have a, just a fascinating reproductive strategy. They are colony nesters, and so they, they nest in groups. And the males, the large males, will take their tail fin and fan out a nest. And these nests are kind of saucer-shaped. But when you see these nests in a, on a lake bottom or a river bottom, there's usually a bunch of them together, pretty close together. And that's their colony. And um, the, the males will create the nest, and then the female comes into the nest, um, and then they spawn. So the, male, the female deposits the eggs, um, the male fertilizes the eggs in, in the nest. And the male, the, the parental male, the large male, uh, will spawn with multiple females. Um, but there's also these really interesting reproductive tactics um, because there's different forms of males. There's the parental male that I've already described, but there's also a smaller male that matures earlier in life, a younger fish, but it doesn't look like a male. It looks like a female, and it's called a female mimic. And, um, and so these female mimics, uh, when the parental male, the large male and the female are spawning in the nest, the female mimic will approach those two. The parental male will not chase it away because it thinks it's another female coming in. And then that 
mimic will slip in between the male and the female in the nest and try to fertilize a few eggs. And so that's one reproductive tactic. Um, and then there's another tactic um, of another early mature, maturing male. And um, these males are called sneakers. And they look like males. They don't look like females, but, but they're smaller in size. And so when the parental male and the female are in the nest spawning, the sneaker male will sneak in, slip in between them and try to fertilize a few eggs. And so there's these interesting different reproductive tactics and strategies that go on in these bluegill colonies. And so, and that was the basis of the story, just to try to emphasize just how uh, mind boggling that whole scenario is, you know, from a reproductive perspective of the bluegill sunfish. And there's a nice parental male bluegill in hand. I also talked about reproduction in darters, and in one chapter I, I, called, I titled it The Darter of Darters, and this was about a fish called the fantail darter. These are small fish. These darters, you know, they may reach a size of about three inches in length. Uh, they're a little bit smaller than that typically, but they're small fish. And the question I asked in this chapter was, how does a female darter, um, a, a female fantail, choose a mating partner? And so the story describes the whole reproductive strategy where the male sets up a territory, a nesting territory under a rock. It's often a flat rock. And the, uh, the, uh, the male then will protect that territory and he tries to attract a female to come in and spawn with him. And the egg deposition is kind of interesting because the eggs are deposited on the ceiling of the cavity, of the rock cavity. And so when a female does come in, she has to invert her body and then she deposits or attaches her eggs to the rock ceiling. And then the male inverts his body and fertilizes the eggs. And there was this idea that, um, that a female is more likely to mate with a male if the male already has eggs in the nest because the male will, um, will mate with multiple females. And this gets us into a, a good part of this story, which is based on um, this, this idea that, that the first dorsal fin of the male has these little um, blobs or globules on the tip of the fin, which look a lot like eggs, as you can see in this photograph. And so the, the hypothesis is that, th that these are actually egg mimics on the first dorsal fin. And the male can, uh, in his nesting cavity, can get up close to the ceiling, erect his fin so that it looks like those are eggs attached in his nest. And a female looking in might see and, and be led to believe that the male already has eggs in the nest and then therefore come on in to spawn with the, with the male. And so it's an interesting hypothesis about egg mimicry. And I tried to... Uh, kind of emphasize that in the story. I also emphasize keystone species. And the keystone species is a, is a species that has an influence on other species in its environment, often a very important influence. And, um, and in this case, I talked about um, nests that are made by a genus of fish called Nicomus, which is actually a type of horny head chub that I talked about earlier. But these Nicomus nests are actually mounds of rock. And so this fish will pick up an individual piece of gravel, carry it over, drop it in one spot, and then repeat that over and over again until he has a pile of gravel in one spot. And that's his nesting mound. And so he builds the mound one rock at a time. And, but what's interesting is that the male creates this mound of rocks, but other species of minnows come and spawn next to him on the nest. And so there's a bunch of different species that spawn because they like this type of gravel to spawn on as well. This fish actually creates the spawning habitat for other species as well as for himself. And so it's a very interesting dynamic among multiple species. And there's a lot of interplay that goes on between the species and each one benefits the other. And so it's a really fascinating um, ecological story. And so I spent a lot of focus on this chapter, just talking about this particular fish. This, uh, in this case, is uh, an illustration of a river chub, which is in the genus Nicomus and one of the horny head chubs. I also emphasize the land-water connection, and this is my last point of emphasis. And I, in this chapter, I, I titled it Trees and Trout, and I talked about the brook trout, which is the only native trout that we have in, in the central Appalachians. It's a very beautiful fish. A lot of people love the brook trout, and I do too. It's just a, a beautiful fish to look at with its dotting pattern, the, you know, the red or 
kind of pink dots that it has on its side and the beautiful white strips on its uh, on some of its fins. It's just a beautiful, very beautiful fish. A lot of fly fishermen will will target and chase after these fish in small streams. They're often found in very small headwater streams. And so this story is about the trout that live in these small streams. And this opening illustration kind of shows you a, a headwater stream that's a hemlock forest. And this illustration is based on this photograph. And you can see the there's a bunch of hemlock trees in the background of, of the stream. And you can see one standing near the center. It's really big, really tall tree with a pretty wide base. Um, there's one right behind that that's kind of over at an angle that, that's died recently. And then there's one on the left side that has died uh, many, many years ago. And there's just kind of an old stump left of that tree. And so I talk about you know, the importance of these hemlocks to the brook trout streams. And certainly the dead wood in the stream is important for brook trout habitat, but it's also very important to have these trees alive because they're very big and majestic, beautiful trees, these hemlocks, and they provide this canopy cover over top of the stream, which prevents the sunlight from getting in and it keeps the stream cool. And brook trout are a cool water species. They don't do well in warm water. And so the by having these hemlock trees present, they really preserve and protect the environment for the brook trout. And so there's a relationship here between the trees and trout that I try to emphasize um, within this story. And I was able to bring in uh, a man named Frank Lloyd Wright into this story. Of course, he's a well-known architect, but he built um, this well-known house in Pennsylvania called the Falling Water House. And it's built on a brook trout stream in a hemlock forest. And so I talked a little bit about this house, but I tried to emphasize, you know, when you go visit Falling Water House, the type of nature experience that you get, not just from seeing the house, but more so from seeing the hemlock trees and the stream. And, and, and so this story was more about the nature experience. And, and I, I think the nature experience often is uh, um, just kind of hits on all, all of your senses. You know, when you go to one of these headwater streams, um, there's the smell of the hemlock trees in the air and, and the touch of the moist moss on the rocks. And you can hear the, the song of the stream, that, that gurgling sound of the water flowing over the rocks. And all those things together make this just wonderful nature experience to have. And, uh, and so it's really important to me that I just wanted to emphasize that and, and talk about how the hemlock trees and the brook trout are part of that nature experience. And we need to try to uh, protect them. One of my favorite quotes from Frank Lloyd Wright was study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. And I, you know, he was coming at this from an architect perspective, but I think it also applies to the naturalist and the ecologist. It, it's a really nice uh, quote to think about. And so in conclusion, I think there's a lot of interesting stories that we can tell about the fishes that we have in the central Appalachians. I've tried to touch on some of the species and some of the interesting aspects of those species. Um, there's a lot of naturalists out there, inquisitive people that have an interest in nature that I think would enjoy um, listening and hearing to these stories. And so that was kind of my target for, for writing the book. And I, I'll end with uh, a quote from the back matter of my book. Uh, As more people learn about the ecology and diversity of our fishes, we improve our chances of protecting and conserving these species. And I hope that um, there will be some time for uh, questions. Thank you so much for listening. Yes. Um, the question was, what is ichthyology? And, and ichthyology is a field of science. It's the uh, study of fishes. So the question was, when the diamond darter buries its body in the sand, how does it breathe? And um, that's a good question. And I've often uh, pondered that question. And I think what happens is the, the fish is embedded in the sand, but the sand is rather loose. And there's water, you know, moving through the sand to a certain degree. 
And so it must be able to get, still get some oxygen across its gills in some way. Um, potentially it could maybe reduce its metabolism in some way at the same time. But obviously if it wasn't able to get oxygen across its gills and it would die. And so it has to have some mechanism to, to stay alive in those situations. And I suspect that there's some water, some filtration going on, um, just enough to, to maintain it while it's in the sand. Oh, the question was, all streams are beautiful. What's your favorite spot? And I think uh, my favorite spot would be any headwater stream in the central Appalachians. I think mo um, most of the headwater streams are really beautiful, and, and they're all certainly a little bit different, you know. But uh, I really like headwaters, as I explained, with the nature experience that you get from the hemlock trees and the, and the sound of the, of the stream. And so... Um, and so it'd be difficult for me to select just one spot, but I've been to a lot of headwater streams and I find them all to be very, very beautiful and, uh, and to provide a wonderful nature experience. Um, so the question was uh, was about uh, Spencer Baird, who was responsible for intro uh, introducing the common carp and, but the question was, uh, are the carp in the Ohio River native? And um, the, those, the common carp in the Ohio River are introduced. Um, all the common carp that we have, they're introduced from Europe. Um, now, we do have uh, some other species of carp that are also uh, not native um, in, in, in the Ohio River now. We have some Asian carp, like the big head carp and the silver carp. And, but those are different species than the common carp. But there are, but all the, all of those previously mentioned, they're all not native. They were all introduced to to our systems. Um, the question was, what was the inter the reason why uh, Spencer Baird wanted to introduce common carp to the eastern United States? And at the at that time, uh, there was. Uh, a, a lot of habitat degradation and a lot of issues with uh, our waterways. And so the idea was to try to provide some type of fish that would provide a good food source and could be, he, he felt like the carp could be raised in ponds on people's property and they would have an extra food source to eat. Um, but the problem was the carp didn't uh, remain in those ponds, you know, during flood conditions and whatever they would get out. And then s soon they were, you know, populating the rivers and streams and so forth. And so they weren't able to contain them in the ponds. And so he didn't, I guess, didn't have the foresight to see that. He just was looking at a way to try to help people have another food source in that time in our history. Yeah, so the question was, uh, most people, um, who would want to eat a carp? And so, uh, um, and I think, you know, in the readings of, of Baird that I've looked at, you know, his idea was that if you um, would catch them, um, you know, outside of their spawning season um, and you prepared them, um, for example, by frying them in, in bacon grease or, uh, or lard, that they would taste pretty good. And certainly there was some surveys done at that time that I emphasize in my story and I give some of the responses. And there were a lot of people that said they really liked them and they were eating them. But then at some point in time, uh, uh, people's attitudes changed and they decided that carp was not good. And so um, to my knowledge now, very few people will catch and eat a carp. Um, so the question is about um, fish and uh, threats from uh, predation, um, and uh, and so it depends on the uh, on the system that you're in, the river system that you're in, and the location. You know, if you're in a headwater stream, um, you know there's a different uh, community of fishes as opposed to being like in the Ohio River. And so most um, most systems, there's going to be some predators, and they're not always uh, um, fish that are 
being predators on other fish, there's sometimes uh, there's uh, you know bird predators like eagles and and there's uh, mammals like raccoons. You know, there's a lot of different predators that can affect uh, can um, prey on 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 fishes, and so it really depends on the system. There's always some presence of predators typically. Um, and, uh, of course, fishes have, uh, ways, you know, to avoid predators and, and, and they, and they do a pretty good job at it, but certainly, uh, predation is always going to be a part of, of a fish's life. Um, the question was, where, where did I grow up? Um, I grew up in, uh, Beckley, West Virginia. And, uh, so that, and then I, uh, I moved, uh, I, I lived a little while in Annapolis, Maryland later in life. And then, uh, and now I live in Morgantown. Um, the question was whether the oil and gas industry will have an effect on, on fish and, and, you know, certainly any type of land use will have an impact on aquatic streams. And part of that is when you start uh, working on the land, um, typically, uh, if you, especially if you're moving earth and, and moving things around, you're going to have potential problems with sedimentation in the stream. And so what happens is you get, um, you know, when it rains, the small silt, and clay particles wash into the stream and that can fill in the spaces between all the rocks which causes problems for the aquatic insects and, and the fishes that live there and um, and so there's a lot of land use practices that have this effect there are you know what we call best management practices and so people try to usually do put those into place where they um, th when they're doing their work on the land they have methods in place that try to prevent a lot of silt and clay particles from entering the stream and so often that is put into play when uh, when there's some kind of uh, land disturbance that's going on So the question was about the gars, and, and um, um, there was some observations about gars uh, with, uh, that are kind of with their heads pointed upstream uh, while they're feeding. And the question was, was the longnose gar that we talked about, does it feed the same way? And certainly I, I have observed gars in that position in, in the stream. A lot of fishes will orient their bodies with their heads pointing into the current. Um, and, um, and, and certainly, um, if for in the gars case if a if a small uh, prey fish would be nearby and that, and that gar happened to be hungry at the time i suspect that it would try to eat it um and um but a lot of times when i see them up like that it, it appears to me that they're almost like they're basking in the sun you know they're just up near the surface and just kind of resting i don't see them foraging or feeding when they're in that mode but certainly they uh, might if there was, uh, you know, a prey item available to do so. Okay, the question was about the migratory mechanisms for fish like eel and uh, salmon, and I and I can speak to the American eel. Um, you know, the main uh, you know, the main reason for the migration is it's part of their life history and it's part of the way that they, um, you know, reach their spawning grounds. And so they they have to move a long distance. But interestingly, you know, there's a there's a lot of species of eels around the world and they all tend to do at least the ones in this particular family do the same thing. They they there's species in, in Australia and New Zealand. There's species in Japan. Um, there's and, and what they they all do the same thing they spawn they uh, grow up in the freshwater streams and then they go back out to the ocean to spawn and so that that life history 
is just innate. That's what they what they done. It's that that's what their ancestors have done in the past. And so that that's just kind of what they do. So it's not a, a learned behavior, really. It's something that they just know what to do, and that's how they that's how they uh, um, complete their life cycle. Yes, yeah, so the question was about salmon and, and following chemical traces in the water. And, and certainly uh, there, there are a lot of fishes that will, um, for example, with salmon, there many often they will return back to the same stream where they uh, were born, you know, to spawn. And they're able to somehow detect the, uh, the smells that are produced by that stream. They're able to key in on that and find the stream. It doesn't appear to be that way with American eels. They seem to just drift along the ocean current, along the coast, and then they just swim up uh, a tributary. But it's not necessarily going to be the same tributary, um, you know, because they're they're. Uh, of course, um, the difference is that the uh, salmon are are, are anadromous, and they're, so they're spawning in you know fresh water and maturing in the ocean. Eels are the opposite. They're catadromous, and so they're spawning in the ocean and growing up in the fresh water. So it's a little bit different of a situation, but but um, your point about salmon is certainly true. Yeah. Um, the question was, are there any endangered species in the Appalachian area? And there's certainly a lot of, uh, quite a few endangered species. In terms of fishes, uh, at least in West Virginia, there are two endangered species. One is the candy darter that I talked about in my presentation, and the other is the diamond darter that I also talked about. Uh, the question is, what kind of impact does trout have on candy darter? Um, there's actually some studies that are planned, I believe, to look at that. Um, certainly, uh, the con a concern would be that, um, you know, if there's a large predator like a trout put in the stream, that it might have some impact on the candy darter population. But certainly, there's already quite a few predators in, in the candy darter streams uh, already. So... So we really don't know what the impact of the addition of trout would have on the candy darter population. But to answer that, I think it would require um, a research study just to see, first of all, do are the trout actually feeding on candy darter? And if so, you know, uh, take a little bit of a closer look with the research on, you know, how that may be impacting the population. 